Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, we've moved into an age of uh, the Americans, the Silicon Valley jargon is solo mo, social, local, mobile. And today I just wanted to take an opportunity to put enterprise content management into a broader context, business context, and talk about some of the key factors driving successful uh, strategic content marketing using ECM platforms. The starting point is that we're all getting disrupted, private sector, public sector, everybody. Even Uber's getting disrupted by the government, which I think is cute because they've been told they have to pay GST. So everybody is literally getting disrupted. And the real question for all of us is, is how are we going to deal with that? And uh, the, bigger, the, the approach now has to be to rethink how we do business and how we communicate with our customers our clients, our consumers, whatever we like to call them, but the people who consume the goods and services that we, our organisations produce. And so it means we need to rethink how we approach our business and how we even think about our businesses. And it's a, it's a new kind of thinking. And Gary Vaynerchuk, who's built a very, very successful multi-million dollar business off the back of social and online channels uh, using really clever strategic content marketing approaches, and he kind of invented some of them, uh, makes the really good point that you won't get a return on your investment if you don't learn how to use the technology and understand the technology. But that's the starting point because it's the processes and things we put on top of it that really matter. So social is kind of obvious. It's we're all doing it. There's nobody here who's not on Facebook. We've all been forced to be on Facebook by our families. Even the people who aren't on Facebook are already in shadow Facebook. So if you think you're a holdout and you're successful in that, you're not. Good luck. Facebook knows and is tracking you. Local, uh, because we have a device in our handbag or in our pocket that knows where we are to within a couple of metres, everything is now delivered to us mo mobile and local. And social was the big thing that shifted. A few years ago, social media hit and brands suddenly thought, oh, we could have conversations with our customers. Uh, at, in the early days, it was pretty non-strategic, pretty tactical, rather random and quite often something that the intern got to do because it wasn't proper and real business. And even today, and this is a stat that I found uh, from, when is it from? From 2015, February 2015. And today we are still seeing people say stuff like brands are moving towards manage, measuring their audience. They're just moving towards it. It's the 21st century. We've had the internet for quite a while and brands are only just starting to think about measuring their online activity. And you can see these other great stats like 58 times more engagement per follower on Instagram. Well, that's great, but so what? Well, how does that translate to a real business benefit? How does it translate to something useful, usable or desirable for our customer? And they're the kinds of things that we see the hype of all of this social stuff, but a lot of the time we're not connecting it to the reality of delivering business outcomes. And this, this chart gives you a good example of that. These are the top brands from last year in the US on social media. And the really interesting thing is they've got great numbers, how much content... Most of them were not deriving direct revenue from any of these social interactions. And this is the, the reality at the moment, that most of us are not driving direct revenue from social, and most of us are not actually optimising our businesses to, to work online. And this is held true for us in, in government as well as private sector, that we really are needing to think about what we want to do. And it doesn't have to be direct revenue. It may be operational support and customer service that needs to be delivered online. But whatever the business goal is, a lot of people aren't doing it very well. Some organisations are, though. And we have reached an inflection point. And it was last year, and it was the crossover between people using desktops to access their internet to using mobile. And a lot of this is the second screen phenomenon, so that people are sitting in front of a television or another screen, maybe their desktop, but using their mobile or tablet. And so they're actually doing two things at once. So they may actually be watching a television program simultaneously searching for an online shopping opportunity in relation to that program. So the interactivity and the interplay between those. And that inflection point's really important for the 
increased focus we're all going to have to have on social, mobile and local. And if your customers don't already punish you for not being mobile optimised, Google will because they've just done a new release of their algorithm that, that downgrades sites that do not have mobile friendly versions online. So apart from being a terrible customer experience, Google will punish you. It's been called Mobile Geddon. I think that's slightly exaggerating. <laughs> Just to put it in a context of our customers and our people, the people inside our organisations, is that I blame Facebook for this mostly. It's, we've been changed. We used to be the kind of people who would wait till Tuesday night at 7.30 for, to go on Channel 7 and watch a show. And now we're like, nah. I want it on the go. I want it while I'm on the bus. I want it on my tablet or my mobile. We want it anywhere we want it, and our kids are worse than us. They just can't see why they can't have what they want, when they want it, where they want it. And this shift is driving consumer behaviour, but it's also driving staff behaviour. Uh, try and take the phones off your staff, see how that goes. And in this context, we're seeing a democratisation of communication. So in the past, to buy access to the media, you had to buy an ad. And anyone who's ever paid money for like a quarter page ad in the front, front of the Sydney Morning Herald knows that's a really expensive option. But now any person or their dog can have a very nice website or digital presence and reach millions of people if their message is interesting enough. So this, there's been this inversion of power relations and that's really feeding into where we need to be thinking as businesses. I like this quote from Kevin Kelly, who's a theorist. He's been thinking about the internet for longer than some of us have been alive, me including. Um, and his idea that, that we're moving to where we've almost, the technology is, is so integrated into our lives that what we do now is fully mediated by the technology. And I think this is borne out by the fact that uh, a survey about two years ago of young men, uh, 17 to 25, found out that they would rather give up sex than their mobile phones. <laughs> now, I don't know about young men now, but young men when I was young didn't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also being driven by the app ecosystem. So we're starting to see apps just be everywhere. And it's becoming the norm that you expect there should be an app. And if there is an app, you expect it to be good. So if you have a bad app experience, you start to associate with that with the brand. So we need to be thinking about that from our content management point of view. And what we are moving on to now is this shift in from customer channels, where the customers lived in nice silos. And you could deal with them in their silos to where the customer exists in a continuum and is trying to deal with us in ways that make sense to them. And they're not always tolerant of our silos as an organisation. And so we're going to have to start to address that in this new context. And this leads us into the uh, need to consider how we manage our teams and how we structure our teams. We've, in organisations, had this problem for many years. How do we break down the silos and how do we get people working cross-functionally? Uh, there are a number of approaches in the IT world. We've done things like DevOps, where we bring all the IT people together into teams and we don't separate development, maintenance and support anymore. Uh, in the Agile world, in Agile software development, we bring the business users and subject matter experts together with the technical people to create the products. And we use uh, lean techniques to make that faster and better. But these are the kinds of things we're going to have to start to look at uh, as our organisations shift into the space. And the reason we have to shift is because the operational tempo is changing. So in the olden days when I started in, in IT, our operational tempo for delivering things was uh, years. Project regularly took two or three years. And so, you know, and operational support could take months. And then we moved into weeks and months, and now we mo then we moved into days and weeks and now the operational tempo for online, for digital and social and mobile is minutes and seconds. And to deliver service and sales in that context means you have to have these integrated teams and we need to start reshaping how our organisations are structured. And this happens with our platforms. So we've, we've really matured the enterprise content management platforms. So they started out a few years ago, there was just a content management system, and you'd get your content management system and use it to publish on your website. 
And then we move to uh, being able to publish across multiple platforms. And now there's a whole lot of technology that, that integrates into that. And that, to me, is just the fundamental basis. If, if we don't already have that in our organisations, that kind of platform, we're really not enabled to effectively start to address these integration issues and being able to deal with the customers. And to me, the, the missing piece with a lot of uh, enterprise content management is the lack of a effective API and web services connectivity because the organisation is no longer just on its own. It's actually connecting out to many other services and many other organisations. So we actually need the ability to seamlessly connect out from our own internal systems out to the rest of the world. And this seems to me to be the area that we really need to focus on from a technology platform perspective within our organisations. And for me, over the years, I've just seen that content management is really converging into content marketing. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that shortly, but this, this whole idea of you just could plonk content out there in an unthoughtful way um, is really dying off because it's not helpful. And you can see it because it doesn't connect to numbers that matter. And this is a good definition. This is um, someone who's really well known for being a good content marketer and has really driven her company's uh, revenues off the back of content marketing. And this idea that the content has to be relevant, valuable and engaging. And it has to be relevant, valuable and engaging across multiple platforms, which means you have to be kind of thoughtful about how you're going to do it. I'll talk about some of the platforms that are outside the organisation a bit later. A lot of companies are doing, and GE is a good example, there's many examples um, to consider, but GE realised that they had a very large amount of information about their vast operations and that they were churning out collateral about their business uh, in volumes that the media market could not consume. So they decided to become their own media platform. So this is a good example of an organisation taking their own content, publishing it. It's now a resource for the media. It's a resource for their industry customers and partners. And what's nice about it from GE's point of view is they're in control of that platform. So they're not beholden to a newspaper editor or whoever. They're not having to pay for that. And when they come up in search results, quite often now their articles from this platform are coming up above news results. So they're starting to own the, own the distribution. So this is uh, sort of a ownership of the control of distribution becomes something that you can bring into your own hands rather than beholden to other parties. So I want to run through some of the key factors about how do we take from the base content management concept into content marketing and some of the things that I've found are really useful and important. And to put it in context, I probably did my first content marketing uh, program at Westfield back in 2003-2004. And I'll talk about some of the things I learned from those early days. So the first thing is this importance of narrative and voice. The company, the brand, the voice because you're going to be publishing across many different platforms in many different contexts, you really need to have an idea of who you are, what you stand for, and how that gets articulated into the outside world, because a variety of people will be writing that copy. It won't be the marketing manager all the time. It won't be the comms manager. And so because you're starting to have these diversified and devolved distribution of content, you really want to have people understand what the brand's on about and what that voice needs to be. The other thing is, is all of this communication outside, to the, outside of the organisation has to really align with your strategic imperatives. And I think uh, our friends at Woolworths are the best recent example of what happens when you get this wrong. Clearly what was on the bottom corner was what was meant to happen and we were supposed to feel all warm and fuzzy about their brand. Instead, they were a laughing stock and they enraged a whole lot of people about it. Now, Woolworths is a big enough brand to survive that, but that's a Class A marketing stuff up. And it, when you think about it, how did it filter? Did it filter through their strategic imperatives? Probably not. Now, that would have gone, in an organisation like that, that would have gone through a whole lot of sign-off. That didn't just happen. The agency didn't just do it. 
we've all sat in those meetings where we get ideas pitched to us and they seem like a good idea and we sign off on them but, and, and we all run the risk of this happening. But it's that filter, what that lens that we need to have to run things through of how this thing aligns to our strategic imperatives and it's a really important question to have ready to discuss when new ideas are being put up, especially when you're talking about new media that potentially your marketing or uh, other internal people may not be fully across or may not have thought through. The other thing is editorial matters. Because of the nature of this kind of strategic content marketing approach, you are really turning your organisation into a publication. Uh, before you would do, remember the olden days where we'd have the closed doors and then we'd do a media release and we'd open the doors and the CEO would step out and say, here's our media release and everyone would duly write it down and write it up and appear in the papers. That's, that's gone now, that boundary where we open the door and let people in, we've got porous boundaries. And so having that internal editorial and cross-media planning is really critical, understanding what is going across and what's happening at the same time. And I've got to say, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, apart from Microsoft and Oracle licensing, <laughs> is cross-media planning in an organisation. So trying to get everybody to say what they're doing when and then having the inevitable debate about, but I need to talk to that customer today, but so do I. And how do we resolve those issues? So input and decision rights around that communication cross-media is really important. Uh, the, the other thing is the integrated content, that it doesn't make sense if you're going to have something in one platform that says one thing and then something over here that says something completely different. So there has to be that alignment and that consideration of how it fits. And this is why leaving these, especially the social channels, to the interns to run is really imprudent and I do recommend against it. Now, the resources are critical, and there is a temptation to consider that, especially for social, activi social online activity, that it doesn't need to be resourced. Well, it does. And I learned this the hard way. When I was at Westfield, we launched a fashion site content marketing program, and we had an editor for the site who was doing the main content, but what we failed to understand was that once we put that site out there, people would ask us questions about fashion. And we got this deluge of questions about fashion, and I ended up with my 13 male web developers sitting there late at night answering questions about fashion while the fashion editor and I ran up and down saying, no, no, leopard print isn't in this year, yes, ballet flats are in. No. It was hilarious. But we did that for two weeks while we went, oh my God, we didn't understand that once we put the facility for people to ask us a question, they would. And we didn't understand the volume that would come in. And so I, I, these, these guys, I still see them now and they still know more about fashion than the average bloke. But that was bad planning on our part. It was still early days then, so it was understandable. But making sure the resources are there and making sure they have the right tools. Uh, things like if you are publishing to social media, does your organisation require an audit trail? Potentially, yes, especially for some of the regulated organisations. Uh, so you might need to look at platforms and tools that integrate not just with your ECM but also provide an audit trail of conversations and who said what, when, in what medium. And those platforms are not free. So part of this is, that, yes, it's easier to do social. It, it might be free in some contexts, but you need to think it through. And the other thing is to have management understand what the commitment is. Uh, so we have had examples of news organisations who don't have their Facebook pages uh, being looked after after hours and then having um, media storms happen and their unmanned websites or Facebook pages get slammed with negative comments. And you've got you to think, how are we going to do that? Do we, do we say we're not open after five? Does that make sense on Facebook? So really thinking about those platforms before we engage in them and say, how are we going to resource that? Do we need to resource it 24-7? The other thing, and this is, this is where we get to repurpose things in our um, enterprise content management systems, that we, we don't want to be constantly creating new content. 
Uh, before I joined UNSW, I was with uh, an organisation called Jenea, and uh, we did a lot of, uh, we started a blogging program. And that was a really great idea. I inherited it from somebody else. But finding people inside the organisation who A, have the capacity, the capability, the willingness and the time to generate blog content about IVF when they're busy doing IVF treatments or doing IVF scientific research is actually really hard. And eventually our solution to that was to hire somebody who could write those stories for them, who could go and interview a busy scientist and say, tell us what you're working on and write it up for them. Uh, so getting those and then having the content so that we could reuse it across different social platforms as well as the blog and then reuse it in things like media releases and other things. So you want to write once and use many, many, many times. Otherwise, your cost to generate that content is really high. Uh, and, and this notion that people inside your organisation have spare time to sit around writing copy for you just doesn't, it's not right. Trust me. And the other thing to consider is it's not about us. The number of times I've been in meetings where we talk about our marketing strategy, our online strategies, and they go, oh, yeah, I don't believe in Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And it's like, well, it's not about you. That's OK. It's about the customer. And because of this, you might need to start thinking about different kinds of platforms to the ones you might have already considered. It's a really easy thing to do right now and say, you know, we're going to do online, we're going to do social, let's just do Facebook. Well, that's great if you want to talk to old people, like me. You want to talk to me or my parents' generation? Great, go on Facebook. There are no kids left there anymore, right? The kids are there, but they're only there because their parents are there and they really don't want us spying on them, so they're gone. So really understanding and doing, this is marketing 101 stuff, audience segmentation, understanding where they are. And the kinds of apps that some of the, the, the other pe kids are using, uh, they're using texting apps. They really love text. They don't want to talk to us on the phone. They do not want to be on Facebook with us. Although if that's how you invite them to family gatherings, they will put up with it. Uh, they really are texting and they don't want to be using their actual SMS texting because it costs them too much money, so they're using their data plans to use texting apps. <coughs> the other thing is uh, kids are starting to see, and this is where you need to start to segment the market, kids are starting to see Facebook as all too permanent, so those hideous photos of them out binge drinking last weekend, they don't really want them on Facebook. They'd prefer them to be on some other kind of app where they where it disappears, or well, they think it disappears. Something like Snapchat where you can share video, you can share images, but they disappear. Uh, even Malcolm Turnbull is a huge fan of Wicca. Apparently he organises coups on it. Because, the, you know, the risk of if your messages being leaked. But these, so, so there's actually a huge growth in use of these self-destructing apps where you can share video, text and imagery, but the, the messages disappear from the user's device. So there's a whole new ways to think about this. And the other um, platform that a lot of people are starting to use for content marketing as part of the content marketing strategy is Tinder. Now, not everyone thinks of doing Tinder ads, but, you know, there's a lot of people on there. And for the right demographics, it can be a very good platform. So you can see that you can be sitting there with your chief marketing officer or your chief financial officer and saying, we need to do Tinder marketing. <laughs> but, you know, it might be the right place. So, so Really, it's got to be relevant to the users. Um, and the other one that's growing hugely now, the, the big growth area is uh, short real-time video. So uh, Periscope and Meerkat, enormous. So people are actually starting to live stream and show what they're doing now real-time. And the neat thing with these apps, so Vine was probably the first big one where you could share video through social channels of stuff, sh short videos. But Periscope, which is owned by Twitter, and Meerkat, which is an uh, independent app, they actually let you connect it up with Twitter so that you can connect up your live streaming video with people being able to give you kisses and share and comment on your live video. And then uh, Periscope actually lets you keep that video and publish it. So people are starting to show their real life. So video is just at the beginning of its growth trajectory. All I'm saying is 
some of these platforms may seem crazy to you and you go, I will never use it, but there is an audience potentially that you care about that may love it to death. Uh, Tumblr. Uh, Tumblr, like grown-ups don't get Tumblr for the most part. Teens are all over it. They love their Tumblrs. Tumblr is a great place to be thinking if you want to reach out to teens. Lots of activity there. And what you need to be doing here as well is scanning the market because these things popped up, like Periscope and Meerkat. Meerkat popped up at South by Southwest this year. So it popped up out of nowhere, was huge, and then suddenly Twitter went, oh, my God, we need something to compete with this. We'll buy Periscope, which is another startup, and suddenly they're the big thing. So this happened in a matter of a couple of months. They've gone from zero to taking over and being really popular in a very, very select segments. I've got to say, my hubby, who's a maths teacher, so not on Periscope. <laughs> not really doing it. But, um, you know, has become a huge Facebook user, which sort of turns us, tells that story. And I knew Facebook had gone totally mainstream when my 70-year-old aunt started sharing her new boogie boarding pictures because she's taken up boogie boarding and she's, just, she's gotten a smartphone. And that, that's when you go, this thing's gone totally mainstream. It's like when I was a kid and a friend's mother started wearing, um, you know, the same kind of clothes as us, we all just ditched it. So that's, that's how you can see the trends. When, when, when we start knowing about it and using it, the kids have moved on. And this, this puts us, the context is everything. So all of those apps actually have communities around them and culture. And what we do has to be culturally appropriate to that piece of technology that we platform that we're putting it on. So what's culturally appropriate on Tumblr or Snapchat is not what's on Facebook or Twitter and certainly not what you probably want on your corporate web page. So, and this is where you could say you might need to vary your corporate brand voice from your website to your Snapchat channel, for instance. So thinking about that, and then the, the other danger that we have in the context is everything space is uh, content automation, because we all do it. It's, it's easy, you can put things up. But I actually saw businesses tweeting special offers in Sydney CBD during the Martin Place siege. Now, they had clearly been automated. They weren't evil people, but they were just not checking. They had forgotten they had tweets going out, and in the middle of all of this stuff about the siege, there's someone saying, come here and buy a sandwich, and you're like, I'm not going to that part of town. So it looked insensitive, but it was also not a very effective offer. So, you know, th thinking it through that context <coughs> piece is, is really important. And the other thing is the analytics, that we can really make this data-driven. The power of all of this is that because on our enterprise content management platforms and our social media management platforms, we're tracking everything. It's a marketer's dream. As a person who does both data and marketing, it's wonderful. Uh, but if you don't build your metrics in to start with, it's really hard to retrofit metrics. And you can start to work out what to do more of and what to do less of really well uh, if you're monitoring your metrics. And just, our, you know, free Google Analytics gives you so much data. And you can already be tracking your social media channels through it. So even if you don't have a huge budget, there's free stuff out there. You can get an enormous amount of value by just looking at that. And uh, when I uh, redid the engineering faculty's 50 websites, so they have nine schools plus the faculty site plus all the research centres, um, two years ago, one of the things we, we, one of the cultural things we set up there was actually looking at the analytics every day, really tweaking the content and then having the content managers re-looking at what's working, what's not, and doing more or less of that. And one of the responses to that was actually to hire a journalist to help write the copy across all of those sites so that, that they actually realised that having the sites and having them be static was not helpful once we've made the investment, uh, that we actually had to keep them dynamic and keep the content updated. And so that's the kind of thing that you might need to, you know, you, you can't set and forget these platforms anymore. And in, in marketing, when I started, we used to just do the thing where you'd get your budget and you'd call the agency and you'd throw it over the fence and they'd come back with a pitch and you'd go, yeah, and they'd go and do it and then you'd look at their numbers and it was all really easy. Whereas now it's all back on us and we have to manage and monitor it at ourselves. We have to look it up to it ourselves. And this, to me, is the big shift, is, is the, the work has shifted. You, can't throw, you can throw it across the fence to an agency, but look what happened to Woolies. 
when that happened and the local on the ground people weren't really thinking through what they were doing and keeping an eye on it. So maybe I'm a micromanager in that sense, but you know, it's your brand and you don't want to mess with it. And the kind, you know, these are your traditional metrics about how many people clicked what and whatever. But I really think what we're going to see now and the ability to measure this is improving every day is the ability to track things like sentiment and preferences. And we can start to drill down very, clo very closely now onto what individuals do. Um, and it's getting quite eerie. You know, just with ad retargeting, it, it's already a big issue. But we can start to look into things like what's the tone of the customer feedback online? You can start to do this. Down at the Australian Open, they are actually using uh, monitoring of social media to drive real-time operational decisions. So they might see on Instagram or Twitter that someone's complained that the ticket queues are too long. So they'll open, on, based on that feedback, they'll open two new ticket booths. So that's real-time operational activity being driven by their monitoring of social media. So these kinds of things are worth starting to think about because they can, it's not just about sales, it's potentially about service. And, and really that whole conversion rate thing is how do, you, how do you work out what's cost effective for you to do with a customer? And because we can monitor all of our digital activity, we can actually look at that. And one of the best examples of this was Dell in the US. Dell um, have an outlet store online and one of their staff just, they went, you know, we've got all the inventory. I can just whack up a web page that people can buy stuff on. And it's all the, all the stuff that's just going out of, models going out of production and stuff. And they, it, cost, it took like a couple of hours of someone's time to create this website. And what they did was automatically set up automatic tweets from De Dell at Dell Outlet or something. And so they'd put a new product up there which would automatically come through from the inventory because it's been marked as for the outlet sale. And then it would automatically tweet and say this, this is available. People would click through and buy. So a couple of hours of someone's work reusing the existing infrastructure and stuff, nothing new really being built. And they got uh, several million dollars direct revenue from that one initiative in the first year they ran it. So that's the kind of thing that, that they were just repurposing stuff they already had and using these channels cleverly and in a way that was relevant and contextually aware and they made money and didn't cost them anything. So they're the kinds of things that we can do. So for me the, the, the summary is, is we really think that content management was where we used to be and we're moving, content management platforms still happen out there but really we're moving towards content marketing for everything that we do. Uh, that the traditional enterprise content management platforms are evolving. They're starting to have the social built in. They're starting to have the workflow built in. And you're starting to be able to use them to, to connect into the social channels and things. And the fundamental for me is the audience matters. And if it doesn't matter to the audience what we're doing, then we really are probably doing it wrong and need to go away and think hard about that. And the conversation that I always have with executives is it, it's not about you. It really isn't about you. It's about our customers and how we give them what they need and want and expect from us so that they build a better relationship with us. And so to me, that's, the, that's where we're going. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>